Welcome, staff, faculty, and students. Welcome to our annual pre-prom assembly sponsored by SAD. I've been doing this for eight years now, and every year the officers of SAD and the members, because I tell them it's their club, they take ownership, and every year we've done something a little different. One, not to be stale, but the other is just everyone has different ideas, and we foster that. After all, this is a school. This year, we were trying to come up with a theme for this. And of course, SAD stands for Students Against Destructive Decisions. And I think throughout the year, we became more aware that the word aware should be in there, not against. Students aware of destructive decisions. That we should all be aware of destructive decisions. Most of us are aware of decisions that are destructive in other people, and we don't want to recognize the ones in ourselves. That's true of you as students. That's true of us as adults. And throughout your life, it's something we constantly fight, you'll constantly fight. So what we're doing today is offering a variety of skits, speakers, to present just a way for you to look at awareness and how that affects lives in ways you might not even realize. Some of it will be lighthearted, and some of it will be very sad. So we just ask you to enjoy what you're doing, but when you leave today, to reflect on what you've seen. At this time, I'd like to introduce Samantha Fraley, our SAD president, and she's going to be your host today. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to Pre-Prom 2014. I'm really excited with what we have to do today. It's new and different than anything we've done before. As Mr. Lewis said, I'm president of SAD, Students Against Destructive Decisions, and Kaylee Allen up here as my vice president will be helping today. Um, before we begin our portion of the assembly, we actually have our former president of SAD, Allie Phillips, here. And for her women's studies class, she's doing a presentation beforehand for her grade. And so she's going to come up here and speak to you first. So come on up, Allie. Significant other, 
that does not give them the right to have sex with you without consent. It doesn't matter who they are. Without consent is rape. Now, don't feel forced to say yes. This is a great thing. It's very important for everyone in the audience to realize that you don't owe anybody anything. Believe me. I Thank you. Now, I don't care if a person takes you out on a date and pays for everything. I don't care if they buy you Tiffany's. Yeah. Very important to me. You don't owe them anything, especially something as big as sex, because why would you owe that to someone? If you don't want to do something, don't do it. Now, if you're scared, don't say yes. If you're unsure, don't say yes. If you want the person to like you more, don't say yes, because in the long run, it doesn't work. And if you feel pressured, don't say yes. I think you all get it. Now, always remember the consequences of sex if you have consent and you end up doing it. Pregnancy, unwanted pregnancies anyway, STDs, things like that. Very important to remember that there are consequences to sex. So now that we went over consent, we have to discuss sex without consent, otherwise known as rape. This topic is not easy to discuss, but it needs to be focused on. Rape is defined as any type of sexual intercourse that is forced upon another person without their consent. I'm assuming most of you didn't know that oral sex without consent is considered rape. And yes, both females and males can be raped. So what are the effects of rape? Rape means to dehumanize someone. You attack them and treat them as they are an object for your sexual pleasure. They are not treated as a person anymore, just a piece of meat. That's disgusting. The pain that someone feels from experiencing a sexual attack is life-changing, and it stays with that person. The worst part of this presentation for me is to tell you how common rape is in the United States. For all of you in the audience saying, I'm always safe. I don't walk alone. I don't go out alone. I don't party. I stay out of the shadows and away from strangers. I'm sorry, but that's not going to prevent rape or any other type of sexual assault. Two out of three rapes are committed by someone the victim knows. It can be your friend, your brother's friend, your sister's friend. It can be someone close to you, a family member. It can be anyone. And I know this is very scary for some of you to hear, and I know we haven't really done things like this, but this needs attention, and this is very important to know. So when it's that rape is one of the most underreported crimes. So when it's stated that 89,000 people are raped per year, there's a lot more. Less than half of rapes are reported, and it's worse in college. According to the United States uh, Bureau of Justice, 95% of rapes in college are not reported. 95%. I can't even imagine. So most of you are going to college soon, and I know this statistic is probably one of the scariest to hear. But listen to me, don't be afraid. Just always be alert and know who your friends are. And this even goes for prom. Know who your friends are. Know where you're going after prom. If your gut is telling you it's a bad idea, probably is. Follow your gut and always follow your heart, because they probably know best. Now, what to do if you're raped? This is something that a lot of people don't know. Because what you do is it happens and you're so scared and you just back away. And you forget and you act like it didn't happen. That is not the route to go down. I really don't want to have to tell you guys what to do to be raped or sexually assaulted because I don't want you, any of you to experience that. And it's so difficult and it's so life-changing. And unfortunately, with the commonality of rape, I have to because I want you guys to be strong and to take care of yourself because you're the only person that matters. If it's someone you know and you don't want something bad to happen to them, well, that doesn't matter. You focus on you first because what they did was wrong. And it doesn't seem wrong because we live in a rape culture, but it was wrong and you need to understand that. The first thing first, get somewhere as safe as possible. Get out of the situation. Tell a trusted adult. Call the police immediately. 
If you're too scared to do that, tell someone who will. Don't let it go. You haven't done anything wrong. And you have to seek medical attention as soon as you have spoken to the police. Or if you want, go straight to a hospital. They'll take care of you and they'll take care of everything else. It's really important. And you always have to remember these things. It was not your fault. You did not provoke the person. You're not dirty or impure because of it. It was not because of what you wore. You didn't do anything wrong. You were not asking for it. And you did not deserve this. Always remember that you did not deserve this or you did not ask for this because no one deserves to be raped or sexually assaulted and no one asks to be raped or sexually assaulted. And please, whatever you do, do not be another of the number of victims of underreported rapes or sexual assaults. You are all strong enough to take action. Don't let it happen to your friends or your family because that is one of the hardest things to deal with. To try and tell someone that, why would you go out with them? They raped me. And to have that person go out with them still. And you feel so much blame, but that's why you have to report it. Don't let it happen to someone you know and that you care about. Because if somebody rapes someone, it's guaranteed that they'll rape somebody else. And to those of you who have been sexually assaulted, and I guarantee there's some of you in this room, it gets better. Once you accept what happened, it, it's terrible to accept it, but you have to. Don't let it go. Because it wasn't your fault, and believe me, it gets better. You just gotta work through it. I have provided a number, if you guys ever wanna write it down. I don't know, it's online. It's 1-800-656-HOPE. It's a number you can call at any time. It's a National Rape Abuse Incest Network, and they do not retain your phone number, and they will provide a support for you. They only take the first three digits of your phone number to locate the safest place for you to go. And they don't get your name, it's all anonymous. But if you need help, call that number. I'm always around. I know all of you very well. I went here. Blue Ridge is a family. Never forget that. Coming back, I learned that. Everybody still knows who you are, and they're here to support you. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I doubt anybody's got any questions, but I'm open for them.
said that the seniors remembered what I said three years ago, which is remarkable because most of my students don't know what I said this morning. <laughs> that you may have to live with for a long period of time. That adrenaline rush, the excitement you feel, you just want to show off to your friends, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. This decision you make could result in a long-term consequence that you will have to live with for the rest of your life. If you take a normal timeline, if I look at the teenage life, if I look at it as a timeline, just about like a geological timeline, you've lived for about this much. Say, take for instance that you're going to live till. 80 or 85 years. You have this much to go. This much has been conquered. This much is left. Don't leave that timeline full of a memory or a consequence that you'll never forget. There's a lot of time left in your life and you want to make sure that's a good time to come. A couple examples that I was thinking of as I got thinking of these examples, I came up with about eight, nine, ten. I finally had to stop myself as many times as I was on these accidents that, that I saw, things I wish I didn't see, involving your age group. I remember an accident when I was about 19 years old, 20 years old. I was home from college. It was at the end of the school year in June. Early in the morning, 18-year-old senior was trying to travel to McDonald's down here in Great Bend Township. And he thought he could go from where he lived down to Great Bend Township and then back to where he lived and back to school in plenty of time. Of course, time was a, a problem and he decided to step on it, pass a few cars in the way. And he lost control of his vehicle. Nothing came out in front of him. No other vehicle got in front of him or struck him. Lost control of his vehicle due to traveling at a high rate of speed and flipped the vehicle several times. His passenger seemed to be okay, but he was entrapped so badly, it took almost 30 minutes to extract him. He's partially ejected, but his lower part of his body was pinned between some of the wreckage. Screaming, sometimes you don't realize the stress of your firefighters in your local area, what they go through is they're trying to do a job, and all they hear is the screaming, the painful screaming, and the yelling to get them out. The screaming that was taking place, the yelling, the fear, we still had a job to do. And although we thought we did it right and assisted the other department that was there, the consequence was that person from 18 years of age to this day is living in a wheelchair. A consequence, that split-second decision, that short-term decision that they made to go fast, to beat the clock, 
get to their destination and return on time has resulted in a long-term consequence, something they'll never forget, something they're never going to get through. Although he's lived a semi-normal life, I bet if I were to talk to him today, if he had that moment back, that split-second time frame to make the decision he did, then I bet he would make a different decision. I was thinking of another one that took place just after I got out of school several years back in early June. And it was a student that just received his high school diploma a week before. Actually, that Saturday. And it was, this was on a Monday, if I remember correctly. We were dispatched to a motor vehicle accident two, involving two cars. Unknown amount of patients were, were on scene. When I arrived on scene, there was a vehicle over a bank. It didn't really look too bad, but I looked back at skid marks that went actually beyond my point of view. I got down over the bank, and there was a wife screaming to help her husband. And I noticed that he was unconscious, and some of the medic and EMS staff started already working on him. We cut the vehicle apart, again, what I thought was in a decent timeline. Didn't really take a good look at the patient because they're supposed to be protected during this process. As they brought the patient out and put him on a backboard, I remember his wife screaming how much she loved him and that she'll see him soon. And she kept yelling, make sure my husband is okay, make sure my husband is okay. He wasn't talking to me. I stood at the base of the hill because we were passing the patient up and I saw people letting go of the backboard as it was coming to me. And to this day, it's tough to talk about the head injury that I witnessed that came into my hands. Guys couldn't handle it, the women couldn't handle it that were on the medic staff and the EMS staff. I stuck with them, brought them up the hill, a couple other people helped, put them in the back of the ambulance, went on to the trauma unit up in Binghamton and 17 minutes later he lost his life. I remember the last words of his wife as they loaded her in the ambulance, honey I love you, I love you, don't forget that, I'll never forget that. And she had no idea what the rest of the afternoon was going to bring. The driver that caused the accident was 18 years old. To this day, he still deals with killing someone. He pays a monetary fine that he will be paying probably until he's 50 or 60 years old. I cannot remember if there was jail time. I can't remember the consequence he suffered legally. I just know that there was some type of settlement involved in which he still struggles financially because of this. That split second decision of speed. It had nothing to do with drugs. It had nothing to do with drinking. <coughs> The outcome of the investigation stated that the vehicle was traveling too fast, that he could not keep control of his vehicle going around a curb that I wouldn't even call a curb. It was a very, very, very subtle turn. He lost control, went into the other lane, and slammed head on into this innocent couple that was on their way into town just to go grocery shopping on a Monday afternoon at around 2 p.m. See, if you make that decision, those are the consequences. When that feeling hits you to speed up, stop and think. It takes just a second to make a decision. Let that decision be the right one. If you are with someone that is driving fast, tell them to slow down. I know it won't be cool, but what's worse? Not being cool for a minute and telling somebody to slow down? Or having your friends injured for a long term period? or being dead yourself, or having your friends dead. Not being cool for a moment is a lot better than being severely injured or dead. You are about to embark on one of the greatest weekends you're going to have in your high school career. Make the right decisions. So the memories this weekend will be great and they will last a lifetime. So the decisions that you make in a split second, make good ones. Because even as I was reflecting on my prom picture that I had to give today, I was remembering those times. And they were both good weekends. They were great weekends. 
and no one made any bad decisions. And that's what I think of when I open my yearbook, or that's what I think of when I see my prom pictures. Because if there's a tragic incident that occurs, that's all you're going to relate it back to. You're always going to go back to that incident every time you look at those pictures and every time you open that yearbook. Make the right decisions this weekend. I look forward to seeing the pictures next week and hearing your stories. Have a great weekend. Enjoy your life.